Hello, I'm Anthony Chan. I'm a consultant rheumatologist in the United Kingdom, reporting here at ACR21 for the Room Now site. Today, it's a great pleasure to have with me Professor Laura Coates, who is a rheumatologist uh, in Oxford and also a key opinion leader in the field of psoriatic arthritis. So welcome, uh, Laura, to our Thank you. interview. It's really nice to see you. So um, we've been sort of following the updates on new treatments in psoriatic arthritis. And I must say, it's, uh, it's becoming a minefield with so many different choices <laughs> now. And not, not only that, we have so many different outcome measures as well that we have in psoriatic arthritis. The whole landscape has changed. It's a really exciting time, but also, I suppose, uh, a challenging time in terms of knowing how to use which drugs. So we've seen that uh, there are some interesting um, posters and abstracts that you have been sort of um, involved in. So I wonder whether we could maybe cover gusilcumab first, which is one of the new treatments and uh, mm -hmm. which you are presenting at ACR. So if you can give us some of your thoughts on gusilcumab. Yeah, so obviously gazelcomab is kind of the new kid on the block in terms of uh, PSA treatments and IL-23s in general, I think, are. Um, they've come to us kind of via dermatology, so they're already commonly used in dermatology and have really amazing responses in terms of skin disease, so have, have clearly... Um, raised the bar of what we expect in terms of response for skin disease um, and obviously now we have licensed uh, for psoriatic arthritis as well so there are two um, large studies discover one and discover two uh, which were the pivotal phase three studies uh, and they've confirmed efficacy in joint outcomes so in acr 20 50 70 um, in enthesitis and dactylitis and obviously in the psoriasis which we expected um, there's still an ongoing question um, about their efficacy in axial disease because obviously we've seen negative trials in AS with IL-23, but improvements in BASDI in the patients from the PSA trials who had axial involvement. So there is a plan for a study to look at that uh, specifically in axial PSA. I um, think that's, um, yeah. Which really will definitely interesting. be interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. really interesting. Um, it, it's, it seems surprising to me that they could be that different, that the drug would fail in one and work in the other. Um, but if that is the case, it would be absolutely fascinating, um, kind of thinking about the difference in pathology between axial PSA and axial SPA in general. Yeah, I think um, they're really interesting. And there are quite a lot of a discussion at the ACR whether these are two separate entities or whether yeah. they're the same condition that is just being over time evolving uh, into a more peripheral or more axial phenotype. Yeah, how similar and how different. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, we also see some treatment differences as in the response is different between a TNFI and, and mm. a P19 or IL-23. So I think there's also a need to dissect them a bit more and understand which patient group they are in. So where, where do you see in terms of uh, placing the, a drug like gusilcumab, one of these newer drugs, you know, in terms of the treatment, would they be better in the naive group, um, you know, post or biologic failure group? Where would you kind of think is the best place to treat these patients? Yeah, so we're just about to publish the data from the COSMOS trial, which was the um, RCT specifically in TNF failure patients who were then treated with gazelcomab. So predominantly DISCOVER1 and DISCOVER2 were biologic naive patients. There were some biologic failures in DISCOVER1, but, uh, but not as many, uh, whereas COSMOS was a specific TNF failure population. And I guess, as you'd expect, and I think this is common across all the drugs, um, the response rate is lower in those who are biologic experienced, but also the placebo rate is as well. So the delta between the placebo and the drug looks pretty similar. Um, that's really similar to what was shown in the select PSA1 and PSA2 trials with upadacitinib. So it seems to be relatively consistent. I think there's a, there's a theoretical argument, at least, for using IL-23s earlier on in the course of disease. Um, but it's difficult, isn't it? But, you know, we are very used to using TNF inhibitors first. Uh, and there isn't, uh, unlike in dermatology, where there's really been a shift in what your first line treatment should be, because you've got clear superiority in efficacy with IL-1223, then with IL-17, then with IL-23 inhibitors, 
we just haven't seen that in rheumatology. We've got very similar outcomes for joint disease across most of our biologics. Uh, and so it's a little bit difficult to really change that paradigm, especially in Europe where the, the cost comes into it uh, and we're typically using biosimilars first line. So I, I think it's a really interesting question as to whether we should be using IL-23 earlier, uh, but I think it, we're a long way from doing that in practice, at least in the UK. So there'll be um, interesting uh, results uh, to look at some of these uh, patients mm -hmm. who are treated a bit later. Uh, you mentioned the um, outcome measures were positive uh, for the study. Uh, but at this ACR conference, there's a lot of work on sort of more patient-reported outcomes as well, yeah. PROs. And I know there was one of the subsequent studies in, that you present, look at some of these outcome measures. I wonder whether you can make any comments on the more patient-orientated uh, outcome measures. Yeah, so obviously there's there's no point just making people's arthritis better if it doesn't make them feel better. Um, we want to be including measures that are important to patients. Um, and I think we're moving forward a lot in terms of the design of those patient reported outcomes. So typically we see questionnaires like the hack looking at function. Um, often as a key secondary outcome. Um, we had a patient orientated workshop for a study just on Friday afternoon and all of the patients hate the hack. They say it's just so outdated and it talks about such old fashioned things like taking a bath and cutting your meat. Um, you know, what about people who are vegetarian? Um, so they find some of those older question questionnaires really bizarre to complete. Um, so, but I think we've made big strides in terms of designing patient reported outcome measures that matter to patients and that are co-designed with patients. Uh, and obviously a big move led in the US has been the development of the PROMISE questionnaires. So these look across all aspects. I mean, it, it's amazingly broad, the number of PROMISE questionnaires that are available. Um, they're smart questionnaires, so you can use them in a computer adaptive testing kind of format, uh, which patients love. So hopefully it means that you're reducing the number of questions they have to complete and also making the questions more relevant to them. So if they've said, no, this doesn't bother me, you're not asking more questions about the same thing. Um, and the PROMISE 29 that we used is looking at kind of general health. So it's looking across all the different aspects of, of a person's health uh, and really looking at the changes that we see with treatment. And unsurprisingly, given that these we know these patients are improving in terms of their functional ability, uh, their joint disease, their skin disease, they're also showing um, a good improvement in PROMISE uh, global health. So I think it's... Um, it's obviously positive data for the drug, but it's also positive data for the patient reported outcome. Um, so we're thinking about moving to more novel outcomes. Um, the patients are very keen for us to leave hack behind. <laughs> I don't think we're quite there yet with the regulators, but, um, but I think that's a really positive move to get additional validity data within PSA or within inflammatory arthritis for some of these more novel outcome measures. But that's really exciting. So the Promise 29 shows promise uh, in terms of Indeed. <laughs> replacing uh, possibly the hack that I know we've used, certainly in our clinics for a very, very long time. And so probably needs a refresh. Uh, just bef you know, on, on before we move to other topic, any, any safety signals in the Guselkimab studies, anything to be looking out for? No, so generally, I think the safety in the uh, IL-23 studies has been pretty reassuring. Um, so low levels of uh, lab, lab abnormalities, you know, changes in blood count or liver disease, um, no massive risk in terms of uh, serious infection. There is a little bit as with a number of the biologics, um, but nothing that looks out of keeping. So I think these are generally quite well tolerated medications. Uh, that are showing reasonable efficacy on the musculoskeletal side and really amazing efficacy on the skin side as well. So there are quite a few other sort of newer agents and some that you've been also involved in the studies. I know there is uh, work on oligo PSA with psychokinemab. There's the axial versus peripheral in upa and acitinib. And then there's a bimekizumab. You can see there are quite a few things where uh, certainly you've been involved in looking at. I wonder whether you could just give us some broad highlights about all these new treatments, where you see them being placed and how we should be using them. 
Yeah, so um, we've got increasing data on some of the other IL-23 inhibitors. So we've got new data on risenkizumab here in PSA. So I think that's certainly a kind of group of drugs that are coming our way in rheumatology uh, from dermatology and will give us extra options. Um, we've got longer term outcomes from the phase two bimikizumab study, looking at IL-17A and F inhibition. Um, and we will shortly, we expect next year, have the data from the phase three trials. And certainly in the phase three psoriasis study, we've seen very good efficacy in skin psoriasis with bimikizumab uh, that seems to be um, higher than the IL-17A inhibition on its own. So it'd be really interesting to see what the phase three data shows, but certainly ongoing benefits in the long-term follow-up of phase two with bimikizumab. Um, Upadacitinib, obviously we've got um, data looking at axial and peripheral disease. Uh, it's really exciting to have another drug that works for axial disease. We've got this controversy in IL-23. We've had negative studies in AS with um, ustekinumab, and we've had negative studies with apremolast. So for our patients with PSA and axial disease, we've got a lot smaller range of options than we do for the peripheral joints. So having efficacy both with upadacitinib and with tofacitinib in AS gives us some confidence about using those in axial patients patients, obviously balanced with the potential concerns raised by the oral surveillance study, again, which is reported here at ACR. So um, all, all the physicians will be aware of the warnings that have come out to us uh, around JAK inhibition. We don't know how much this is a class effect, uh, but obviously, particularly in our PSA patients, they often do have other risk factors. Uh, they are at significant risk of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, hyper, hy hyperlipidemia. Uh, so I think there's going to be some caution uh, reasonably about using the JAK inhibitors in the PSA patients. Um, we'll have to wait and see um, how that pans out, I think, in practice. So uh, you've been very involved with the uh, the GRAPA guidelines and it's been a very useful chart to have in clinic where you have the six domains and then you kind of work your way down with all these agents. I think more than ever, we need this in psoriatic arthritis. I was also interested to read about your work in oligo uh, PSA. I think there was a study using sacikinumab. Uh, wonder whether you can make a short comment on that. Yeah, so I think the oligoarthritis patients are the, the lost tribe within psoriatic arthritis. They often don't get included uh, in the large clinical trials, or at least not in large numbers. Um, and we essentially treat them with the same medications, but there's a lot we don't know about oligoarthritis. I think it's a really big unmet need for our patients. So it's great to have some data and some specific studies looking at oligoarthritis. So um, in secukinumab because they have so many large trials of secukinumab in PSA, they are able to pull out a subgroup of patients who had at least three tender and three swollen joints to get into the study, but had less than five. Um, so they they represent an oligo population. Um, I think there are uh, other studies planned specifically looking at the oligoarthritis phenotype. And I think there's so much more we need to understand about these patients because I certainly find them difficult in clinic. I can't advise you whether it's likely to progress um, if we've, we, we don't have strong uh, prognostic factors that we can use. Um, some of my patients with milder oligoarthritis say, well, actually, I, I don't really need to take treatment. I don't want to have regular blood monitoring and go on to disease modifying therapy unless it's going to stop things getting worse. And I don't know the answer to that. Um, so I think there's a lot we could do around natural history and um, observational studies that would be helpful in oligoarthritis as well. So a lot more work uh, to be done. And it's great to um, see researchers like you kind of increasing our knowledge and understanding of not just the treatments, but also the understanding of the condition itself. So uh, thank you very much, Laura. Thank you for your time uh, and for sharing with us your key insights. Uh, and that's been really helpful. Uh, so, um, so we're going to sign off here now. Uh, I'm Anthony Chan reporting at ACR 21 and a pleasure to have Professor Laura Coates with me uh, talking about new treatments in PSA. Thank you. Thanks.